Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I am joined by author and scholar Amanda H. Padani. Amanda is Professor Emeritus of History at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona, and she specializes in the study of Syria and Mesopotamia in the Middle and Late Bronze Age. Amanda has written numerous books, including Brotherhood of Kings, How International Relations Shaped the Ancient Near East, and The Ancient Near East, A Very Short Introduction, among others. But today, she is joining me to chat all about her new book, Weavers, Scribes and Kings, A New History of the Ancient Near East, published by Oxford University Press. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure, thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to speaking to you about your new book, Weavers, Scribes and Kings. Um, so why don't we start off by you telling us a bit about what the book is all about. The book is a history of the ancient Near East from 3500 BCE to 323 BCE. But rather than being a traditional political history, it's a history that looks at the lives of real people and for each era, I take a number of people that I look into, um, their experiences, their professions, their, their whole world, in order to understand the bigger picture of the world in which they lived. And so that rather than, as I say, rather than being a political history, it's like a series of social histories, a series of vignettes of people's lives throughout this 3000 year period. Wow, that's pretty incredible, because I feel like those kinds of books on you know ancient history very commonly focus on kings and militaries because that's sort of where we have the most information. Um, so can you tell us a bit about the kinds of people or the kinds of jobs that they did? What, what kind of, what did you actually go into? Yes, I, one, I had a list when I started writing the book of the professions that I wanted to look at and I was looking for people in those professions. And there are some that are, obviously there are lots of kings there are plenty of kings, there are queens, there are priestesses. So there are elites in the book. But there are also, um, as in the title, weavers and scribes, are very important people in this community. And there are brewers and innkeepers and farmers and soldiers and just so many different professions um, that are represented in the texts and that were people who were important to the culture. And in each case, I've tried to find a, a named person um, so if I'm writing about weavers, I have a number of weavers whose names we know, who are real people, whose lives we can actually look at. So it's not just a sort of generic exploration of their experience. It's specific. This is a person who lived, who is in the records, who we know about. Wow, that must have been such a sort of intimate experience, actually looking into specific people and specific lives, because I feel like when it comes to, to history in general, it's always very broad, you know, knowing about groups of people and and professions but never having that sort of personal touch is it have you done this kind of research before or was this sort of a brand new experience for you it it is it sort of draws out of, of of research i've done in the past partly because anyone who studies cuneiform records um this is what we do but the, the cuneiform records are full of people and so when i was doing my um more specific research on a kingdom called hana uh, which is in the second millennium BCE, the documents are about individuals. So, for example, um, there's a particular little neighborhood in a town and I've studied the families and their family trees and who was related to whom and who lived next door to whom. And that's, that's very natural because that's what the documents have. That's what they include. But I think your point about this book, what was really fun for me in terms of writing it, was getting to know all these different people in different periods. And I describe it in the book as though it, it's almost like going into someone's house and sitting down and having a cup of tea with them, or in their case, it would have been a beer, you know, because they drank a lot of beer, um, sitting down over, over uh, you know, a meal and finding out about their world. And I think as I was writing it, I very much felt I was having that experience that these people gradually sort of opened up the more research I did, the more I read about them. And so one feels that you come away really having met someone rather than just having um, read about them. Wow, that must be such an incredible and also potentially a surreal experience since these people lived so long ago. Um, and you mentioned cuneiform tablets. 
are they the main kinds of sources that you used or was there a whole different types of resources that you got to you got to um, work with? Most of the written documents are in cuneiform and that was um, by design. So the whole Middle East, the ancient Middle East, a lot of it used cuneiform and that's what I'm trained in. Some parts of the Middle East used um, uh, a hieroglyphic script that they wrote on papyrus and that I don't read. And so when uh, the, re the regions of the Middle East that I can't read in the original documents, I decided I wouldn't put in this, not just because I couldn't read the documents, but because the cuneiform area forms a real cultural whole, you know, that it's, it's, it makes sense as a culture to look at um, together. And that includes what is now Iraq, Syria, what is uh, now Turkey um, and Iran, parts of Iran and parts of um, uh, the region of uh, Jordan and Israel at various times, but not uh, throughout um, the whole period. And I left Egypt out because Egypt has its very distinctive history. Egypt comes in occasionally when it's in contact with the, the cuneiform regions. But so much is known about Egypt and it is so widely discussed. You know, there are a lot of books on ancient Egypt that I wanted to devote the pages that I had to a field that is much less well known. And that's this region of, of the cuneiform lands. But the documents, yes, um, there are about half a million cuneiform documents that are known that are in museums around the world. It's a vast, vast corpus. And it's uh, fascinating. I mean, there's so many different types of texts, so many different um, hundreds of thousands of people named in them. It's just incredible. And there's also the archaeology. So the other sort of major source for the book is the sites, the archaeological sites from which these tablets have been found. And they're very intimately connected because you don't have the tablets unless you have the archaeology that they all were dug up out of the ground. And so we can see it both as a, um, as a physical, uh, artifactual source material that is available for this, and also the cuneiform records uh, that, that very closely tie in with them. That's pretty incredible. So you read cuneiform, you read all the, I'm assuming the numerous different languages that cuneiform was used to write. Um, did you, so you did your own translations of, of no, these documents? not for the most part. I mean, with 3000 years of history, um, you know, there is, <laughs> it's just too much to have done new translations. And I didn't really need to because most of these documents that are, I was using are available in translation already, or at least, you know, they're in a, a volume where you can find them. So um, what I did was after I'd chosen the professions that I was interested in, I looked at what other scholars had already written because there's so much written in this field. It, it's a vast, uh, just a vast bibliography of sources. And then having found what's already written, I would then go back and look at the sources in translation and in some cases look at the original sources in, um, in their cuneiform versions. But that was mostly just a check on a word or two, you know, rather than doing the whole thing from, from scratch. It would be, it's, it's a very time consuming thing to do translation and I couldn't possibly, possibly have done it for this. No, you'd still be writing the book, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> if yeah. you did all that translation. <laughs> I would still be translating. No, I'd, yes, it, it would be, um, it, it would be a, a lifetime work at that point. Um, so as you mentioned, there are so many books on the ancient world, on the ancient Near East. Why did you decide to write this book? Well, there are a lot of books um, on the ancient world, there's surprisingly fewer than you would think on the ancient Middle East uh, for a general public. There's a, oh yes, vast, vast, vast numbers for within the field for, you know, people writing for one another. But I think that there is a, a sort of um, almost a hole in the knowledge of, of a lot of people about the ancient world. They know about Greece and Rome, they know about Egypt, they know about Israel. But for whatever reason, the ancient Middle East hasn't made that same kind of impact. And of course, there's, and I'm not bringing up here, China and India and Africa and you know, the Americas, but just within the region that I'm looking at, the Middle East is, is surprisingly less known other than, than the biblical history. And so what I wanted to do was to try and make available to a general reading audience some of the amazing work that's been done, the, the research that's been done, the sources that have been read, the, the interpretations that have been made of these, and, and to sort of take my colleagues' work and, and get it out to a wider public, as well as my own work, obviously. But it is so fascinating, and it is such a big part of history. I think 
one of the things that people are often surprised by is that this isn't just a short period of time. This is 3,000 years that this civilization continued and thrived. And that's more, what three fifths of urban culture, since the beginning of urban culture, three fifths of it was this period. And, and so it's not something that we can just sort of glance over and say, okay, well, done with that, let's move on. There is so much depth to it that is worth looking at. Oh, yeah, it's massive. So was it, how was the process taking, um, you know, information and work from a purely academic space and then transferring it into one for a wider, more broader general population? This is one of the things I love to do because I find it so fascinating that I am um, really inspired to try and make it something that will be interesting to other people as well. And I think uh, one of the reasons that I, I feel that perhaps I can do this is I've been teaching this material for a very long time. And um, I see what my students find fascinating and what surprises them and what questions they have. And based on that, I, have a I had a sense of what I th thought would, would be fascinating in the book. And in fact, I had my students read chapters as I was teaching this subject and they would, they would give me feedback and they were very, very helpful. Uh, but I think it's not as hard as you would think to trans translate what scholars have written into um, language that, that is just uh, more accessible because they've done a wonderful job already. I mean, I'm not suggesting that I am uh, somehow taking something that was very obscure and making it accessible. They've done that work. It's just that it's been published in academic journals that's very, that are hard to find. If you're a general reader, they've been published in books that may be very expensive, that are from academic publishers. And it just felt as though this is a way of kind of opening the window to this field for people where they can then go and read the works if they're interested by the scholars who've worked on it. Fantastic. And how awesome is it that you gave your students the ability to give you feedback? Because I feel like knowing what students, how students receive that kind of information and what they find interesting is such a good start to really figuring out what the general populace would enjoy. Because yes. I feel like students' brains are, you know, they're interesting. You never know what they might find fascinating. <laughs> no, exactly. They would, they would um, underline, because they had this all in just manuscript form, and I, I gave it to them in hard copies because I, I didn't want to give them um, PDFs that they could have circulated that was supposed to be um, kept, you know, because it hadn't been published yet. And they would hand them back to me with, with highlights and, this is so cool, or, you know, I'm not understanding this. And that's, that's great because that made me realize what I was assuming about their knowledge and what I would then need to elaborate for a reader. It was fun. They were great. Um, so obviously you have been working in the field. You have so much knowledge about the ancient Near East. Did anything surprise you or interest you more than you thought it would whilst doing the research for this book? I was, I was surprised, I think, by some of the continuities because my field where I do my research is in the second millennium BC, um, especially the middle of the second millennium. So uh, sort of 1800 to 1300 BC mostly. And when I'm writing the chapters outside of that period, although I've taught this stuff before, it's not where I do my research. And I think I was really struck by um, the, the many things that were shared throughout the period. So from the beginnings of cities in 3500 all the way to Alexander the Great, many of the same institutions existed and were viewed in the same way. And so it's, it's a strikingly, in some ways you would think it perhaps a conservative culture in that they kept these, these um, systems going, but at the same time, a very successful, stable culture that in spite of the fact that there were invasions and that there were language changes, for example, they worshiped the same gods, they lived in the same cities, they used the same writing system, they sh cared about many of the same things um, they had the same types of professions. Uh, and, and some of the things that I already knew uh, just were really emphasized as I, as I did my research. So, for example, um, I've done a previous book about uh, the relations between states in the ancient world and especially about diplomacy and trade. And you see this diplomacy, this desire for um, reaching peace agreements from the very beginnings of civilization, uh, of, of, of ancient Near Eastern civilization, all the way up to Alexander the Great and beyond, of course, but that was where I stopped the book. But this, uh, the desire for peace is there, even though they went to war, they, they wanted peace. And you see that over and over again. And the 
um, the trade relationships that they had. Oh, throughout this period, there was always trade going on. And one thing that's, that's particularly striking is that one of the most important traded materials were textiles. And that's why I put weavers in the title, because the uh, people of the ancient Middle East had in different regions, they had different natural resources, but in Mesopotamia, what is now Iraq and in, um, in Syria as well, one of the main resources they had was sheep, uh, that they had herds and herds of sheep that would um, graze in the steppe lands outside of the, the river valleys. And those sheep produced wool and they made apparently extraordinary textiles because they don't survive. They're, none of these are, are still to be seen. But the descriptions of them, the amount of time they took to make them, means that this was a really, really beautiful art that they made. And that was the, one of their major exports. And so throughout this period, the women who did the weaving, and it was largely women, were really central to the economy. They were, they were the ones producing these amazing objects that were then traded or given in diplomatic um, gifts. And women were often also in charge of the the weaving houses that they were. So this was a, a very female enterprise for much of, of Middle Eastern history, ancient Middle Eastern history. And, and you see that from very beginning right up to the, the last period that I was looking at. Wow, that's incredible. And it's just because you've just mentioned women. I mean, sort of just generally speaking, there tends to be less about women from the ancient world than men, um, just, you know, across most of the cultures. So there was a lot about women was it sort of even <laughs> um it's a patriarchal society so it wasn't uh, it, it was not in any way uh, women women weren't running things but that said women had a lot of um autonomy in various periods uh they weren't failed for the most part they could uh, represent themselves in court they could own property and they did have a number of professions in which they were dominant and um, weaving was one of them uh, innkeeping, um, brewing was often a, a female profession. Uh, they also, very importantly, played roles as priestesses and queens that were really powerful positions. They, these were women who had significant uh, power over, uh, they would control um, estates, that of huge estates of land and herds of sheep and goats and fisheries and all kinds of things. And there would be a woman in charge if it was a, a high priestess of a temple. She was the top person. One thing I tried to do with the book, though, was to be true to the time period in that women are not an add-on at all in ancient Middle Eastern history. And so in each chapter, if there's a, an important group of women or important women, they're in there, not just, oh, and we're going to add a woman here. They're there because they were central. And, and um, I think that's so important to realize that it's we don't have to look for them. It's not like, oh, gosh, better find some women. They are everywhere in the history. And I think perhaps because they weren't rulers, that there are no really ruling queens um, who ruled alone. There are certainly women who ruled with their husbands. But I think if you were just doing a traditional king by king history, they get left out. But if you go anything, even a tiny bit beyond that, the women are everywhere and they need to be in the in the story. That's brilliant. I love hearing that. I think for our last question is, what is one thing that you think that people should know about your book or sort of the topic in general? One thing they should know about the topic. I think they should realize that people in the ancient world, and this isn't just the ancient Middle East, this is in general, they were absolutely human. They had emotions, they had things they passionately cared about. They were, they were as human as we are in all the same ways. You know, they had a sense of humor, they worried about things, they were civil to each other, they cared about their children. You know, there's so much that we share, the shared humanity is really there. And I think that the further away in time we are from people, the more we tend to imagine them as almost cartoon characters, you know, that they, as if they couldn't really have been as real as we are. And what I hope people get out of reading the book is to get a sense of that humanity, that shared humanity that we have with them. What a wonderful place to leave it, I think. Thank you so much, Amanda, for joining us. Um, you can purchase Weavers, Scribes and Kings. Um, we'll leave a link for it down below, published by Oxford University Press. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. 
This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my shirt, you can find this design and a bunch more in our shop at worldhistory.store or you can find a link for it down below. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you soon with another video.